Suspicions are being laid that Russia is secretly getting rich, and our adversary the US has all the symptoms of disintegration. Let's start with Russia. Every time we think about Russia's military spending, we get uneasy. Well, just imagine, the salary of a serviceman is at least 200,000 rubles. How many of them are serving there? Well, at least 600,000 people. Moreover, these 600,000 are brand new. They were not in the army until 2022. So the salary for that 600K is a brand new expense item. It wasn't in the budget until 2022. Multiply 600,000 by 200,000 and we get 120 billion rubles a month. That alone is minimum wage. Salary. Add to this increased salaries for officers, payments to the wounded and dead, all sorts of extra payments for hit vehicles, and so on. We think at least 200 billion a month for all those combined salaries and benefits is required. Next, guns and ammunition. 10,000 artillery shells per day, tanks, airplanes, fabs, I'm not even talking about crews and ballistic missiles, and sophisticated air defense systems. How much does it all cost? Very expensive. One cartridge for the machine gun costs 25 rubles. And that's millions of rounds of ammunition alone. Next, supply. A soldier should be dressed, clothed, brought to the place, given tools to build fortifications, refuel equipment, fed three times a day, and not with instant noodles, but with normal food. In short, what's it like to maintain a 600,000-man army under combat conditions? Well, if we estimate from the couch, we think 600 billion rubles every month, that's the minimum additional spending that our budget didn't have until 2022. Although in reality, it could be much more. The sequel follows. At the same time, the country is under sanctions, pressured from all sides. They'll cut a gas pipeline, shut down an oil pipeline, disconnect our economy from the global financial system, freeze assets, refuse to buy goods, and deal painful blows that require serious finances to recover. The Crimean Bridge, for example, oil depots, ports, and so on. And then you think about all of this, and you can't believe how this economy is still holding up. We were told by supporters of all sorts of oppositionists before 22 that the economy was ruined and hanging by a thread, that the country was flying into the abyss. Officials only think about how to fill their pockets and so on. But even despite gigantic military spending, Russia's supposedly tattered economy is not just hanging on, but growing faster than it did before 2022. For this year, they are predicting 4% growth, although it will be more, I'm sure of it. This is with negative growth in Germany. The country is being actively built. We travel around the country a lot. And everywhere there are construction sites, roads, interchanges, neighborhoods, new enterprises, factories. Entire highways are completed during this period. Period. Moscow Kazan, for example. Dozens of subway stations have been opened. Thousands of facilities like schools, kindergartens, hospitals, stadiums, and so on have been built. Moreover, a whole new region of Novorossiya is being rebuilt. Mariupol is being built from scratch. Roads are being laid. Utilities, light, gas, sewerage, water supply. Enterprises are being built, and all this is financed from the state budget. And that's just construction. But what about social security benefits? Maternity capital in all these events was not canceled, but increased. Pensions and benefits are being indexed at a rate they have not been. Emirati rose by one-fifth at once. When was that? And they promised to increase twice more to 35,000 rubles. All that child support stuff. I'm confused as to how many there are. They keep putting it in and putting it in. Please note, we don't mean to say with these words that we just have everything perfect, wonderful, and life is now chocolate. We just want to say that despite the gigantic military spending, spending in other areas has not decreased, but has also increased and increased markedly. In other words, Russia's budget and the conditions of sanctions and dispersal of the military-industrial complex is not just not being cut, it is being increased. This suggests that Russia has secretly, or at least imperceptibly, acquired a lot of money in recent years. From where? Well, for one thing, energy prices have risen. Secondly, non-resource exports have grown. A huge number of different enterprises have been under construction in Russia for probably 10 to 15 years. Third, the tax system has been optimized. A significant part of the business has been taken out of the degree. And now they're paying taxes. Fourth, many companies have returned from offshore to Russia. Fifth, in general, capital outflows abroad were rapidly limited. The West, which itself cut us off from the global financial system, helped. Sixth, tourists began to travel abroad less, leaving money for vacations inside Russia. It's also a kind of restriction on capital outflows. Seven, many enterprises have been bought out by the state or simply nationalized. Eighth, progress in the fight against corruption is evident. We have an old memory of thinking, I think there is a lot of it, but if you look around and compare it to what it was 10 to 15 years ago, it is heaven and earth. I'm both about grassroots corruption and corruption at the top. While there is much more that can and should be done, the advancement is substantial. And most importantly, for every item on this list, even greater improvements are expected in the coming years. Energy prices will rise, the shadow economy will shrink, 
Factories will be built and some will be nationalized. Domestic tourism will grow. That means Russia will have more and more money. That's why the president's message was so optimistic. Well, now let's move on to the United States. Let's start, perhaps, with the brightest. Both candidates and former President Trump and incumbent President Biden traveled to Texas. The Texas governor met with Trump and ignored Biden's visit. Can you imagine any governor in Russia ignoring Putin's visit and meeting, for example, with Nadez Dina himself? By evening, he would have written a confession that he had stolen everything that had been stolen in this region since Ivan the Terrible. And whoever says it's wrong is a very stupid person. And here came the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, the guarantor of the Constitution, and the head of the executive branch and whatever. Biden met only with federal border patrol agents, who were still being kept away from the border. That is, everyone came to their own. And if the country is divided into its own and strangers, and party affiliation turns out to be more important than the structure of state power, then it is already a civil war. Just still in the sluggish preparatory stage. A house divided in itself will not stand. Meanwhile, the formal head of the Republican Party, Michigan McConnell, who supported giving money to a country everyone knows we are in conflict with, has announced that he will resign his position in the near future. The positions of radical Trumpists are growing stronger. Now for the numbers. They're just freshly arrived. According to CNBC, the average credit card balance jumped 10% to a record $600,360, and more consumers have started delaying payments. The rise in credit card delinquencies seen in 2023 could continue this year, creating peculiarities, a particular risk for smaller banks. According to a recent report from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, delinquent debt rose more than 50% last year, with total consumer debt reaching $17.5 trillion. Credit card debt that developed into a serious delinquency, defined as a payment 90 or more days late, was 6.6% in the fourth quarter of 2023, up from about 4% at the end of 2022. Serious delays have reached the highest level, levels since 2009, the time of the Great Recession. Overall, credit card debt is up 14.5% from a year ago in 2022, when household debt is up a more modest 3.6% from a year earlier. By comparison, in 2007, when the mortgage crisis began, delinquencies were in the neighborhood of just over 5%, now they are higher and the jump has happened in a very short time. At the same time, outstanding loans grew faster than total debt. This means, in plain language, that people cannot take normal loans and plug the holes by taking microloans at higher interest rates. The amount of consumer debt at half the national debt, which is also prohibitive, is something. And recall, these are no longer loans at about 0% interest, as they were during the days of quantitative easing but now the Fed discount rate there is 5.5%, so consumer loans are even higher, from 8 plus annual percent. And the combination of high debt with high interest rates is killer. And Fed Chairman Powell reported a couple days ago that inflation over the last six months is higher than predicted, so there will be no rate cut in the near future. And although Speaker Mike Johnson has said that Congress will be busy with budget issues in the next two weeks, recall that the budget was supposed to be passed by early October and it's already March. But so far, the prospects for compromise between the parties are very dim. All in all, a political crisis, an economic crisis, a managerial crisis. It's perfect.